This is it. This is the B-29, the plane you've been waiting for. And it was worth waiting for. It's the biggest, fastest, mightiest heavy bomber in the world. It can travel farther and higher than anything else on wings. It has a pressurized cabin, permitting high-altitude flight without oxygen masks. It has five remotely controlled, electrically driven turrets, each carrying twin 50s, with a 20 millimeter cannon added to the turret in the tail. Yes, the B-29 is everything you've been promised. And the pilot who flies one has an enviable job. Important, glamorous, and tough. Here's a B-29 pilot. He's measuring the distance between pin centers on the left landing gear. This part of the job isn't so glamorous. But it's the pilot's responsibility to make sure that everything on this biggest bomber in the world works properly. If you were a B-29 pilot, here's exactly what you'd have to do before an operational flight. Check the nose wheel. See that the tires are inflated to 45 to 50 pounds per square inch. While measuring the pressure, look over the tires for general condition also. Watch out especially for cuts or signs of serious wear. One of the ground crew will replace the dust covers, but you're still responsible for his work. After you've measured the pressure in both tires, give the gear a visual check. The strut should be clean, with a clearance between pin centers of 10 inches. And the shimmy damper must be full. That's important. Make sure the rod is almost up to the notch in the gauge on the shimmy damper reservoir. Now you can look over the engine cowlings on your way to the other main landing wheel. This gets the same inspection you've already given its mate. The co-pilot ducks into the wheel well to inspect the equipment there, while you work on the wheels. Measure tire pressures again. On these tires, the pressure should be between 75 and 85 pounds per square inch. Inside the wheel well, the co-pilot examines the wires, connections, and switches. He makes sure all the cannon plugs are on tight, paying particular attention to the plugs on this motor, which opens and closes the nacelle doors, and also to the plugs of the normal and emergency landing gear motors. Then he turns around to examine his side of the strut. He looks it over and inspects the brake lines, making sure that the hose is not chafing and no fluid is leaking. Meanwhile, you're checking the clearance between pin centers again. Thirteen and one quarter inches. Right. Now, are the wheel chocks in place? One behind the inboard tire and one in front of the outboard tire, just as it should be. Next, check the cowlings, inspection doors, and inspection plates. You've already examined some of them, but you must be sure all of them are okay. The other members of the crew help you out with these inspections. Here, for example, a gunner tests the fastening of the top cowling. But you'll have to check the security of the other coverings, and there are a lot of them all over this ship. While you're walking along, you can examine the wing seams. Fluid leaking from them means trouble. Now to check the ailerons and trim tabs. All control surfaces and all trim tabs must be inspected. Test the tabs for excessive hinge play by shaking them. And see that the gas tank caps are tightened. If there were extra fuel tanks in the bomb bays, their connections would have to be examined. But now the pilot and the co-pilot continue their tour around the plane. They have a lot to check. Hatches, windows, control surfaces, trim tabs, inspection plates and doors. But the pilot and co-pilot aren't the only crew members with inspections to make. The gunners, for example, besides helping the pilot check the airplane, must also be sure the guns and gun cameras will work properly. They must inspect all five turrets in the same way they're now examining this lower rear turret. After they have the dome and gun cover removed, they see that the ammunition moves freely in the chutes and is correctly loaded. The guns just don't fire with the cartridges in backwards. They also check the safety wiring on the gun mounting bolts, up in there. Then the gun charging switches are put on reset. That conserves the CO2 pressure, which automatically charges the guns. Finally, the gun camera is inspected. Enough film, speed set at 16 frames per second, lens adjusted to the brightness of the day, and the interval control put at the desired number of seconds and turned on. And this turret is all right. The dome and gun cover can be replaced. The tail turret is checked by the tail gunner. But again, the pilot is responsible. If the guns fail, he gets the blame. 
So he watches the tail gunner as the Shatterall feed mechanism is inspected. Now the other gunners only have to lock the latches. Elevation latch locked. Azimuth latch locked. The doors are shut and fastened, and the gunners can go to another turret. And there's still more work to be done. Each engine must be pulled through 15 blades, with only two men per blade. The engineer takes care of that. He sits at his position, making sure that all switches are off, while the four engines are pulled through. And now the co-pilot puts on his clothing and collects his equipment before joining the rest of the crew for inspection. Notice that the crew members wear fatigues while making their inspections and change into flight clothing only when they are ready to enter the plane. The examination of the exterior of the airplane is completed. So the crew can fall in for the check of their personal equipment. That's the last item of the before entering the airplane part of the procedure. And it's strictly the pilot's job. Your job. You are responsible for the men as well as the plane. If they fail, you're at fault. Each crew member must have his electrically heated flying clothing, parachute, oxygen mask, knife, a quart of water, and may west. Steel helmets and flak vests are already inside the ship at the positions. Apparently these men are completely equipped. But don't think they only have to climb into the ship and fly away. There's a lot yet to be done. Let's go along with the pilot again and see what he has to do to take a B-29 into the air. He climbs in through the hatch in the nose wheel well. That entrance is also used by the co-pilot, engineer, navigator, radio operator, and bombardier. There's work for every man before the engines are started, during engine starting and warm-up, before takeoff, after takeoff, and then a whole list of additional things to do before landing again. As soon as the radio operator gets in, he climbs back to close the pressure door between the forward compartment and the forward bomb bay. The bombardier is the last one in, so he closes the hatch. The gunners close the pressure doors in their compartment. They also open the cabin pressure valves, which will now automatically maintain the cabin pressure at the desired level. Three compartments in the plane, the pilot's compartment, the gun control compartment, and the tail gunner's compartment, are sealed off from the rest of the fuselage and supplied with this compressed air. The cabin pressurizer keeps 8,000 feet altitude inside the plane until the outside is at 30,000 feet. If the plane gets higher than 30,000 feet, the pressure inside drops off gradually, but it is always 13.4 inches of mercury more than the outside pressure. But let's get back to flight procedure. The gunners take care of the other pressure door in their compartment. But what about the pilot? That's you. You already have your chute fastened, your May West on, and the seat adjusted. So you put your throat microphone and earphones on. If you put the mic on first, you won't get so badly tangled in the wires. Don't forget to plug in your disconnector cord. Now to start work. Ask the engineer for forms 1, 1A, and 01-1-40, and look them over. Be sure that everything on Forms 1 and 1A has been checked. Pay particular attention to the list of defective equipment. If anything vital is out of order, it must be fixed before taking off. The weight and balance computation is in Form 01-1-40. That's important. Make sure it's correct. When you've examined all the forms and signed them, you can give them back to the engineer and tell him to start the putt-putt. You have to turn on the emergency ignition switch. The tail gunner looks after the putt-putt, starting and stopping it on orders from the engineer. But now, you set the jackbox selector switch to command, and turn on the proper command receiver and the command transmitter. This puts you in communication with the control tower. Now examine your own equipment. Look over your oxygen mask, and make sure your portable oxygen bottle is fully charged. Then try out the cockpit lights. To test the ultraviolet lamps, turn on the switches, and twist the shutter. You should then be able to see the light. By turning the shutter back, you can control the amount of ultraviolet light emitted. Next, try out the alarm bell. The gun commander will tell you if it's working. Then depress the brake pedals and pull out the parking brake knob to set the brakes. Look over to the control stand and make sure that the emergency releases and switches are correctly set. 
power transfer switch, emergency landing gear release, emergency bomb release, emergency cabin air pressure release, and pilot's over control. Now unlock the control surfaces and throttles by moving the locking lever on the aisle stand full forward. Then release the throttle brake and test all four throttles through their entire range. Take it easy, move them slowly and gently. All controls on the B-29 should be handled in this careful manner in order to prevent damage to the mechanism. There's no need to push hard. And the co-pilot doesn't just sit and read the checklist. He must test the action of the control surfaces, moving each surface, elevators, ailerons, and rudder through the complete range. The gun commander looks from his blister, observing the response of the surfaces, and reports to the co-pilot. A similar test is made on the trim tabs. The co-pilot turns the three control wheels as far as they will go in each direction. That big wheel on the side of his control stand operates the elevator tabs. The aileron and rudder wheels are on top of the control stand behind the throttles. The way the trim tabs follow the setting of the control wheels is also observed by the gun commander, who tells the co-pilot over the interphone how the tabs move. The co-pilot turns the tabs back to neutral after testing them. And now to try out the wing flaps. But first he calls the side gunners on the interphone to make sure none of the service crew will be in the way of the descending flaps. When the gunners report that it's safe to go ahead, the co-pilot presses the flap switch to the down position and holds it there until the flaps have been lowered 15 degrees. 15 degrees is enough to tell if they're working all right. The co-pilot can't see the flaps, of course, so he watches the wing flap position indicator. But the gunners can check visually. They tell the co-pilot if the flaps come down all right. So now he can bring them back up. The gunners, again, will tell him when they're up. Don't start thinking the gunners have nothing to do but watch control surfaces and flaps. They have their own checklists to follow. The right side gunner, for example, is looking over his supply of spare lamps and fuses. Yep, that's okay. But now you, the pilot, are almost ready to start the engines. See that the automatic pilot master switch is off. Check over the four sets of control surface adjustment knobs, making sure all their pointers are up. Then set the manifold pressure selector to the zero position. And depress all four propeller RPM switches to the increase position and hold them there until the lights on the co-pilot's instrument panel flash. Now you're all ready to start the engines. And the rest of the crew should be too. They check in with the co-pilot, reporting in this sequence. Bombardier, who sits directly ahead of the pilot, and co-pilot, navigator, who is some distance behind the pilot, facing forward, flight engineer, who is directly behind the co-pilot, facing aft, radio operator, who sits across from the navigator and faces the right wall, gun commander, who is in the top of the fuselage amidships and can face in any direction, left gunner, who faces aft, right gunner, who also faces aft, and the tail gunner who stays close to the putt-putt during takeoff and landing. His combat position, of course, is in the tail. Everybody set now. Warn the service crew outside you're going to start the engines and tell the engineer to start number one. And number one engine spins twice. And now he turns the fuel boost pump on, closes all the throttles except number one, sets the fire extinguisher to number one engine, presses the starter switch to energize, and then flips it to start, and finally turns the magneto switch to both. You have to push the throttle to 1200 RPM and signal for number two. The same procedure is repeated until all four engines are running. Now that the engines are going, vacuum pressure is available to operate your gyro flight instruments so the gyro compass and the flight indicator can be uncaged and set. The co-pilot will be doing the same with his gyro instruments. Next, see if the other vacuum pump is working all right. Have the engineers switch to the pump on the number two engine. The vacuum may drop some, but it should go back to about four inches. Now you can call the control tower on the command radio. It's already on. 
This is about the right time to get your taxiing instructions, since you'll soon be ready to move out to the runway. At the same time, ask for the field barometric pressure so you can adjust the altimeter. It must be set carefully to the correct pressure. In this case, 29.84 inches. Obviously, an accurate altimeter is a vital necessity, especially if you may have to fly on instruments. Next, you want the bombardier. You know he sits back with the navigator and the radio operator until the ship is in the air. But right now, he has to come forward to make the final checks on the bomb site. He's already completed the regular pre-flight inspection of his equipment. All he must do now is see that the bomb site is entirely ready for takeoff. The directional clutch should be disengaged and the secondary clutch engaged by turning it clockwise. Then the drum wheel must be turned counterclockwise as far as it will go. That does it. He's all set to take off. And now you're ready to close the bomb bay doors. Ask the ground crew outside if there are any obstructions underneath the plane. Everything's clear, so you can order the bombardier to close the bomb bay doors. He throws the door switch while you look back through the pressure door to watch them shut. The rear bomb bay door is looked after by one of the gunners, who will tell you when it's closed. When both doors are shut, the bombardier can go back to his takeoff position in the rear of the compartment. And you're almost ready to taxi. But you'd better make one last check of the turret warning lights. Uh-oh, that lower rear turret light is on. Call one of the side gunners and have him take care of it. Perhaps the turret wasn't stowed. Forget about it, gunner? Well, it's easy to fix. Get control of the turret, press the action switch, and stow it. That does it. There, that turret warning light is off now. And everybody's set. Switch your jackbox back to command and signal the ground crew outside to remove the wheel chocks and get a safe distance away from the airplane. The co-pilot warns the crew to stand by to taxi. And you can release the brakes and move the ship out to the runway. While taxiing, or whenever the plane is moving, all crew members watch from the windows and keep the pilot informed of obstructions. The gunners can provide the most help since the blisters give them a wide view. This is a big airplane. It's mighty easy to hit a fuel truck or another ship and clip off part of the wing or stabilizer. And that doesn't help the flying characteristics a bit. Notice the flaps are kept in the up position. If you taxi with them down, the undersurfaces are likely to be damaged by pebbles blown back by the propellers. After you've stopped at the edge of the runway, put in your call to the control tower for permission to taxi on the runway. When the tower has given the clearance, move on the runway. Steer with the outboard engines, not the brakes. Excessive use of the brakes on a plane as heavy as this one will wear them out quickly. As the ship is turned around at the far end of the runway, notice again how the engines are used for steering. You can see the right propellers moving faster than the left. When you're at right angles to the runway, stop for the engine run-up. Tell the flight engineer to get ready to make his magneto check while you run the engines up, one at a time. First, press the propeller RPM switches to the increase position, holding them there until all the propellers are at maximum RPM. Next. Turn the manifold pressure selector to position 8. With the knob in this position, the superchargers automatically provide military power. Now advance the number 1 throttle, but slowly and gently, to 2,000 RPM. Hold this speed until the engineer tells you the magneto check is finished. Then press the propeller RPM switch to the decrease position until the tachometer drops about 200 RPM. Now flip the switch to the increase position and hold it there until the light on the co-pilot's instrument panel flashes and then push the throttle to full open. The tachometer should show about 2600 RPM for the number one engine while manifold pressure should be around 47 inches. 
To see if the turbo is working properly, turn the manifold pressure selector towards zero. That should make the manifold pressure drop. The turbo's okay. Bring the throttle back to idling, around 550 to 600 RPM, and increase speed to 1200 to avoid fouling the spark plugs. Next, start on the number two engine. The same procedure is repeated for each engine. Now you're about set to take off. After you're cleared for takeoff, turn the plane the rest of the way around so that it points down the runway. And stop again while the co-pilot lowers the wing flaps about 25 degrees. He can tell when they're right by looking at the wing flap position indicator. And the gunners can check on the accuracy of the indicator by watching the flaps from their blisters. They report on the approximate flap position over the interphone. When the co-pilot tells you the flaps are okay, fasten your safety belt and set the manifold pressure selector to position 8. Next, set the propeller RPM switches to increase RPM and wait for the lights on the co-pilot instrument panel to flash. Then warn the engineer to be ready for takeoff. Stand by for takeoff. Now you push on the brakes hard and open the throttle slowly until the manifold pressure gauge reads about 40 inches. Then release the brakes. As you gather speed, slowly advance the throttles to full power and set the throttle brake. Manifold pressure should go up to 47 or 47.5 inches. RPM should go up to 2,600. Continue accelerating down the runway until the indicated airspeed gets up to 95 miles per hour. Then slowly pull the control column back, putting the ship in a flying attitude. The plane takes off without further action on your part when it gets flying speed. The exact speed at which it will leave the ground depends on the weight. When the ship is airborne, apply the brakes to stop the wheels and then have the co-pilot retract the landing gear. He has to hold the landing gear retracting switch in the up position because the switch is spring-loaded. The co-pilot makes sure the nose gear is up by looking through the inspection door on the floor of the cockpit, just ahead of the aisle stand. The wheel is there, all right. At 160 miles per hour and 500 feet altitude, the co-pilot retracts the flaps snapping the switch on and off until the indicator shows that the flaps are all the way up. The side gunners should be watching from their blisters as the plane takes off. They tell the co-pilot when the flaps and landing gear are up. Now you ought to change from takeoff power setting to climbing. Adjust the manifold pressure selector until the manifold pressure drops to 43 inches. And decrease propeller RPM to bring the tachometers to 2400. You can order the engineer to have the putt-putt turned off now and tell the bombardier to come forward and take his combat position in the nose of the ship. If this is an operational flight and enemy opposition is expected, have the men put on their flak vests. These vests are made of small overlapping links of tough steel sewn inside canvas. Quilting on the inside of the canvas provides further protection and also cushions the shock of impact. Above 10,000 feet, oxygen masks must be worn by one man in each compartment. When you reach the desired altitude, level off and tell the engineer to set up cruising conditions. First, you move the throttles back to about 65% of full power. Individual manipulation of the throttles may be necessary to keep each engine at the same manifold pressure. Now you adjust the propellers and manifold pressure, so turn the controls over to the co-pilot. Start with the props. Press the propeller RPM switches to decrease and bring all four propellers to 2,000 RPM. Then turn the manifold pressure selector down until the manifold pressure drops to 30 inches. The needles should stay together in this case. There you are, 30 inches. Considerable juggling of throttles, propellers, and supercharger may be necessary before you get it just right, but that's how you get a B-29 into the air. It's a big, heavy, and powerful airplane. Bigger, heavier, and more powerful than anything you've ever flown. For that reason, 
It must be handled gently and precisely. You must carefully follow the prescribed procedures. Even a super bomber is no good to the army if it's in little busted up pieces. But don't get jittery. The 29 is a sweet ship to handle. When it stalls, the nose drops so that the plane automatically recovers. There's no tendency to spin. Stalling speed varies quite a bit naturally depending on weight and other conditions, but generally it's between 84 and 135 miles per hour. When turning or executing any maneuver, take it easy. This is a big plane, remember, not a fighter. Yet fairly steep turns can be made safely. This 30 degree bank can also be done with full flaps. That's about the limit. And when evasive action is necessary, you have plenty of tricks to pull. Just watch this B-29. And the B-29 does more than just fly well. It packs a terrific wallop. A wallop enemy fighters will quickly learn to fear. That turret you see moving is only one of the five on the ship, which mounts a total of ten machine guns and one cannon. Four of the turrets, two on top and two beneath the fuselage, can turn through 360 degrees in azimuth, 90 degrees in elevation. The tail turret is more restricted in movement, but it has a 20 millimeter cannon in addition to the twin 50s the others carry. But the big thing about the 29's armament is the fact that the gunners don't touch the guns. The guns are controlled remotely from special sites, and any gunner can fire almost any turret. For example, one side gunner might have control of two turrets, firing four caliber 50s at his target. That's only the beginning of the story about guns, so let's get back to what a pilot has to do. Now you're ready to land. Since you've descended below 10,000 feet, remove your oxygen mask. Tell the co-pilot to take over control of the ship so that you can get out of your flak vest. The vest is easy to take off. Just pull on the cord and it drops away. This speed of removal becomes important if you ever have to bail out, since the vest is worn over the parachute and, well... You figure it out. If you've been riding with the automatic pilot, turn it off. You can't use it for landing, of course, or when taking off, flying turbulent weather, or setting trim tabs. The co-pilot should now warn the crew to prepare for landing and tell the bombardier to climb out of his seat in the nose and get in back with the engineer. Then the co-pilot has the engineer start the putt-putt. You check the turret warning lights. All the lights are off. Then call the control tower and get landing instructions. At the same time, ask for the field barometric pressure and set the altimeter to correspond. Now the co-pilot hits the brakes to test the hydraulic pressure. Both normal and emergency systems should have 800 to 1,000 pounds. To find out about the emergency pressure, you have to ask the engineer. At the same time, you can see if he's ready to land and get his log. He has calculated the new weight and center of gravity, since you've used up a lot of gasoline by now. You should look the log over, but the co-pilot will check it carefully, examining the center of gravity and weight computations. The table on the instrument panel gives the stalling speed for the computed weight. The co-pilot tells you the stalling speed, 
and also reports that everybody in the crew is ready to land. Next, you adjust the propeller RPM switches. Push them to increase until you get the tachometers to show 2100 RPM. Now adjust the manifold pressure selector to give you plenty of reserve power. Turn it all the way up to position 8, the setting for full military power. When the plane has slowed down to 180 miles per hour or less, order the co-pilot to lower the landing gear. When the switch is set to the down position, the wheels descend all the way, lock, and the gear motors automatically stop. When the left and right gear are down, the side gunners, who should now be watching the wheels and flaps, will report to the co-pilot. He himself can make sure the nose wheel has been lowered all the way by looking through the window in the floor of the cockpit. Next, the flap should come down. If you've been in combat, the co-pilot should lower them first only five degrees. If they were damaged, lowering them all the way might rip them off the wing. The gunners can look them over and report on their condition. The flaps are all right, so the co-pilot can lower them 25 degrees. Notice that he snaps the switch on and off. That way, the flaps descend gradually, and a sudden change in the lift characteristics of the airplane is avoided. The gunners will report when the flaps appear to be down 25 degrees, and the co-pilot can check by looking at his wing flap position indicator. When he has the flaps where he wants them, he'll tell you. Then you'll probably have to reset the trim tabs because of the change in the flap position. Next, adjust the throttle brake to a comfortable tension. And don't forget to turn off the detonator power switch. Now make a standard approach, keeping the speed about 30 miles per hour above stalling. And on the final approach, order the co-pilot to lower the flaps all the way. When you touch the ground, the plane should be slightly tail low and going between 95 and 100 miles per hour. Notice how the main wheels bear most of the shock of landing. Then the ship slowly settles forward. Don't apply brakes immediately. Let the plane lose some of its speed rolling. Then turn the manifold pressure selector all the way back to zero. You won't need the turbos anymore. and set the propellers at increase RPM. Raise the flaps now while you're taxiing and have plenty of power. You're down now. You've followed your checklist step by step. But there are other checklists. The engineers, for example. So suppose we go back over that landing procedure and see how the engineer's checklist fits in with yours. Five minutes before landing, the engineer tells the tail gunner to start the putt-putt. The ship enters the traffic pattern at a 45 degree angle to the downwind leg. Altitude is 2760, speed is 180. Here the co-pilot lowers the wheels. The mixture controls are set to auto rich and the cowl flaps open 15 degrees. At the end of the downwind leg, the speed should be about 140 or 150 and at least three generators must be on. The co-pilot lowers the flaps 15 degrees. After the pilot makes the procedure turn, the altitude should be 2260 feet. The co-pilot lowers the flaps to 25 degrees. The pilot sets the manifold pressure selector to position 8 and adjusts the propellers to 2100 RPM. Just before the final turn, the engineer checks the magnetos and turns the boost pumps on. Around the turn, on the final approach, speed should be at least 140, altitude 800 feet. Also, six generators should be on. Finally, the co-pilot lowers the flaps all the way and calls out airspeed and hydraulic pressure as the ship descends to the runway. After the airplane's on the ground, turbos come off and propellers are set to full increase RPM. 
The engineer switches the boost pumps off and opens the car flaps all the way. All right, we're back where we were before. Tell the bombardier to come forward and open the bomb bay doors. The doors should always be kept open when the ship is standing still to prevent the accumulation of gas fumes. Next, turn off all the switches. Then you can get rid of some of your equipment that remains inside the ship and climb out for the after-flight inspection. Yes, you start with an inspection and finish with an inspection. If there was anything wrong, now is the time to find out about it. And now is the time to correct it. Yes, this is the airplane that you've been promised. Now it's up to you to weld this airplane and its crew into a single irresistible instrument of destruction. That can be your promise to us. B-29 Superfortress, now a decaying hulk. It once crippled an empire and in a single stroke of terror ended a war and changed a world forever. Its recurring echo still sounds from those gone but not forgotten days. April 1942, under the command of Colonel James H. Doolittle, 16 B-25B Mitchell bombers lifted off the rolling deck of the U.S. carrier Hornet. With a belly full of bombs and fuel, they were bound for the Japanese home islands, the first direct bombing assault on Tokyo. It proved a costly but needed boost to Allied confidence, but demonstrated a desperate inadequacy, a strategic long-range bomber, a weapon foretold in Doolittle's post-mission statement. We're going back to Tokyo, and we shall go in full array and with mighty allies. The B-24 Liberator, an extremely versatile bomber, could not meet the range, speed, altitude, and load requirements now envisioned by the War Department. Neither could the B-17 Flying Fortress, another magnificent plane. While they flew countless successful missions over Europe, they were already being uploaded by designs on the drawing boards back home. The huge Douglas XB-19, first flown in 1941, was a flying laboratory to test the principles of big aircraft. In 1940, the War Department called for a bomber capable of speeds, altitudes, loads, and ranges that the underpowered 19 couldn't match. It became a competition between the Consolidated and Boeing companies. The Consolidated B-32 Dominator powered by four Wright R3350 engines specified for use by the War Department. It was pressurized, and below large, it was not seen to break any major new ground. It would just fulfill specifications, but offering little more than a conservative step forward. Adopted as an insurance policy, if the radical Boeing Model 345 failed, only 15 B-32s saw active duty, although over 100 were built. The winning design was the Boeing Giant, designated XB-29, top speed over 350 miles per hour, ceiling over 30,000 feet, range approximately 4,000 miles with a 10,000 ton payload. The big fight of the first XB-29 was on September the 21st, 1942, over Boeing Field, Seattle. Test pilot Eddie Allen reported that low horsepower was a problem. But in flight, the big aircraft handled superbly. The early Sperry gun system and three-bladed props seen here were not incorporated in later models. Much important data was obtained from this first XB-29. Not so with the next XB. On its second flight, 
it burst into flames. Eddie Allen, his ten crew, and nineteen civilians perished. Such horrifying losses were not allowed to impede a project which the war depended on. The XBs were soon back flying. The B-25 Mitchell is a big strapping bomber. 67 feet across the wings, but it could reach Japan only if it took off from an aircraft carrier. Much bigger is the famed B-17 Fortress. 104 feet from wing tip and tip, it has ranged 1,400 miles over Japan's island conquests. But it cannot reach Japan itself from any base we now hold. The Super Fortress. Wingspan, 141 feet. Longer than the Wright's first flight through the air at Kitty Hawk. Range, altitude and bomb load, secret. By June 1942, the first of 14 pre-production drab-painted YB-29s were airborne. The theories of the radical design on trial. The 29's huge bomb bays were set forward and aft of center of gravity. Maintain stability during drops and its a volometer released payload from alternate bays. Inside, crew quarters were heated, pressurized and soundproofed. In the forward compartment, the bombardier sits in the extreme nose of the plane, below and between the pilot and co-pilot. The pilot sits on the left. The co-pilot on the right. A navigator is behind the pilot, facing forward. A flight engineer is behind the co-pilot, facing aft. The radio operator is behind the flight engineer, facing right. In the aft compartment, along with the rest area, are the gun commander in a barber's chair, observing through a plexiglass blister atop the aircraft. The two side gunners to the left and right of him, the tail gunner mans the putt putt auxiliary starter motor. His normal position is in the pressurized tail compartment. The huge wings set mid fuselage were quite radical. Boeing departed from the conventional bridge truss configuration, settling on a web type structure. Flaps increased wing area by as much as one fifth for low speed flight, takeoff, and landings. The retractable twin-wheeled tricycle landing gear was a great advantage for such a heavy aircraft during high-speed landing runs, even after extensive combat damage. The 29 used another innovation, the General Electric Remote Gunnery Control System. All guns were sighted and fired remotely. Four of the turrets, two on top and two beneath the fuselage, can turn through 360 degrees in azimuth, 90 degrees in elevation. The tail turret is more restricted in movement, but it has a 20 millimeter cannon in addition to the twin 50s the others carry. But the big thing about the 29's armament is the fact that the gunners don't touch the guns. The guns are controlled remotely from special sites, and any gunner can fire almost any turret. For example, one side gunner might have control of two turrets, firing four caliber 50s at his target. A small central computer made corrections for wind, temperature, altitude, speed, and extended range by correcting for bullet drop. Gunners using this remote system experience no jarring recoil and gun vibration, easing the task of holding a target in sight. Gun camera footage of fighters shot down is terrifyingly real. A camera is activated by the firing mechanism. It is seen here mounted between the twin machine guns of the aft lower turret. Long high altitude flights call for pressurization. The 29's circular cross section hull gave a necessary uniform strength. The Boeing auto pressure regulator controlled pressurization. The fact that it was pressurized and the altitude was brought down to simulate 8,000 feet, that whenever any kind of a window pops out or a rupture from, uh, if it in combat, uh, in the uh, fuselage, would cause a sudden rush of air out of that to equalize the pressure. 
And uh, especially when you're at higher altitudes in the thin atmosphere. And so because we had to travel from the forward deck to the back over the bomb bay through a tunnel, which was a little bit confining in that you couldn't wear your parachute with you, but while you're in that tunnel, if you should suddenly depressurize at that time, you got the feeling that you might be a projectile in a cannon going shot right through the tunnel. So it was a little apprehensive about going in there at times, especially at high altitudes. The massive engines were at the time the most complex and powerful ever built. Four Wright R3350 radials, turbo supercharged to produce 2,200 horsepower. The huge props were geared to rotate very slowly for high altitude performance. This was a very special aircraft. Spurred on by Pearl Harbor, the US now geared up for wartime production. By January 1942, B-29 orders were doubled to 500. Labor shortages foreseen. Processes were simplified for unskilled workers. Designs were broken down into components for allocation to many production facilities throughout the US. Final assembly production lines also spanned the nation. 1,600 B-29s would be ordered. But not all was in the swing. The B-29 project had slowed to a crawl, crippled by its vast logistic and organizational problems. The Battle of Kansas was about to be fought. The difficult we do immediately. The impossible takes a little longer. The situation was that the B-29 had to be sent to war within a specified time. And uh, it was the job of the people uh, under the command of Arnold to make that happen. So they ended up with a situation where they had approximately five weeks to get the B-29 into action. And unfortunately, they found the worst weather conditions possible. They had problems with transportation of parts. And uh, they also were dealing with a situation where they had partly trained crews who were trying to complete modifications to the airplane. Um, as things went wrong and had to be replaced, these crews learned on the job. And you had a situation, for instance, where they were fitting modified radar sets but they had never fitted radar sets before of any kind. Under direct presidential pressure, Arnold stepped in. It said 60 armchair generals turned up to impress him, but he meant business. Signing the 175th 29, Arnold demanded it be ready by March the 1st, 1944. By the 28th of February, the Hap Arnold special plus all 29s ahead of it had been rolled out. Before the Superfortress deployment to India and the Pacific, an elaborate cover plan was executed. Obo Queen, the only YB to see active duty, was sent to India via England. It toured the UK for two weeks in an attempt to mislead the Axis to believe the 29 was to be used in Europe. Not an hour after landing, a German reconnaissance aircraft was seen flying overhead. China, the focus of Japanese aggression for many years. Here was an opportunity to straight back. Mainland China offered forward bases close to Japan for the new B-29s bound for permanent bases in India. The Pacific posed the problems that bore the concept of the 29. The B-17 and B-24 had both proven great aircraft over Europe with shorter distances from base to target. The Pacific posed huge logistic problems vast expanses of ocean that conventional warfare had not yet encountered. The B-29 was simply the only aircraft that could reach Japan. 
the 20th Bomber Command was specifically created to hold the B-29s together as a single force to strike Japan. The 58th Very Heavy Bombardment Wing was made up of the 40th, 444th, 462nd and 468th Bombardment Groups. They were bound for the heat and dust of India, half a world away. Travelling east, the first stop, Ganda Bay, Newfoundland. Across the Atlantic to Marrakesh, Cairo, Karachi, and finally Calcutta. In preparation, thousands of Indian workers and US construction troops had upgraded Indian airstrips to take the big bombers. The bases were scattered around northeast India at Karangapur, Chakulia, Piadoba, and Dudkindi. The forward bases in China lay on the plains of Chengdu, just in range of the southern islands of Japan. From Calcutta, everything had to be ferried in a massive airlift operation across the jagged peaks and deep gorges of the Himalayas, the treacherous pump covered in ice and cloud, but lay before the vast plains of Chengdu and the forward bases. Converted 29 tankers flew the route, three gallons used for every one gallon of fuel offloaded at Chengdu. Four airstrips were constructed, each 8,500 feet long, to service the huge bombers. Each rock was turned into handmade gravel to fill and flatten the old rice paddies. China mobilized its one huge resource, people. Over a third of a million laborers worked on the construction, using simple barrows, buckets, and wooden tools to reform the landscape. Fighter aircraft also had to be accommodated. Strips were built for them in southwest China. These rollers weighed up to 10 tons and were hauled by as many as 100 men. But all this cost money. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek charged the US government over $200 million in gold for the effort. By April 1944, B-29s were landing in China, ready for the raids of June. Raids that would prove disappointing. Along distances, much at high altitude, the treacherous Himalayas, the golden airstrips of Chengdu transform into $200 million bogs by torrential rain. The initial conception of a B-29 could be self-supporting a fallacy. A fuel run across the hump couldn't keep up with demand. After the first wave of June the 14th, raids were held up for a protracted period as there were only 5,000 gallons of suitable fuel in the whole of China. These bases would not spell the defeat of Japan. There were many raids from these Chinese bases, but range from China limited targets, the 29s just being able to reach the southern tip of Japan, only biting at its heels. The turning point came mid-1944, when after much bitter fighting, the Marianas Islands were wrested from the Japanese. The loss caused the fall of the Tojo cabinet. These were, for the B-29s, the stepping stones to Tokyo. The three islands, Hua, Saipan, and Tinia, were only 1,500 miles from Japan. Construction of five B-29 bases on the three islands commenced groups working hard coral formations into airstrips through tropical heat and sudden rainstorms. On October 12, 1944, the first B-29 landed on Isley Airfield, Saipan. Jarton Josie, the Pacific pioneer, carried the new commander of the 21st Bomber Command, Brigadier General Haywood S. Hansel. As Arnold's Chief of Staff in Washington, he directed the India-China offensive. He would now control the 21st of the Nariyas. Well, the first element of the 21st Bomber Command has arrived. When we've done some more fighting, we'll do some more talk. Ansel was a planner and a staunch believer in strategic high-altitude precision bombardment. The bombs rained down on industrial and economic targets throughout Japan, but results were again poor. 
B-29 losses grew as the enemy concentrated defensive fighter squadrons around these targets. The high altitudes the B-29s had to climb for such raids were causing huge operational difficulties, many aircraft ditching on the long journey back to the Marianas. Arnold beat it results. Amso was relieved of his command, Arnold replacing him with General Curtis E. LaMay. Maybe this man could turn the tide. Iwo Jima, captured soon after LeMay's appointment. The island sits around halfway from the Marianas to Tokyo. Japanese held, it was taken by U.S. Marines in February, March 1945, with a tremendous loss of life. The still hot volcanic rock of Iwo Jima was carved into an unsinkable aircraft carrier. Now there was a safety stop in emergencies, fighter escorts for the B-29s, and Japan was being pushed back at last. LeMay, not a devotee to any specific tactical doctrine, would try new ideas to get results, ideas that would eventually burn the heart out of Japan. I'd say that they respected and feared him, but they knew that he could do the job and hopefully would keep them alive. Uh, previously, they'd been suffering serious losses in the B-29s, and uh, LeMay came along, changed the tactics, made the airplane work. LeMay found that Hansel had built the B-29 bases in the Marianas into a well-organized war machine. The Navy had shipped in massive stockpiles of cargo to service the vast armada, safely out of range of Japanese attacks. LeMay could see no reason for the 29s failure to perform apart from the tactical use. He had the weapon. It was a case of using it in the right manner, efficiently and to its full devastating potential. LeMay would at first allow missions to continue as before. Daylight raids hitting from high altitude in formation using heavy explosives. He would observe the characteristics of the missions and devise a startling plan. Missions were planned in great detail and the map rooms collated huge amounts of data. Here was the control center for all B-29 operations against Japan.
even as these bombs rained down on Japan's cities, LeMay had pieced together the Offensive of Fire, a campaign that in just 11 days would put to the torch 29 square miles of urban area. In the following months, more fire raids paired with an extensive aerial mining campaign would choke and starve the nation. Removing war guns and ammunition except the tail armament and leaving the gunners behind would mean a huge saving in weight, allowing more payload the new M69 incendiary firebox. At night, the 29s would approach the target at five to 8,000 feet in single fire, guided by Pathfinder B-29s, marking the target with a huge cross of fire. They may observe that Japanese anti-aircraft guns were not greatly effective at low to medium altitudes, and their night fighter capabilities were very limited. Lower altitudes meant more range, neither three times greater payload, and less strain on the engine team. Flying back to the Marianas after missions, the crews now had the haven of Iwo Jima for emergency landings. Many dropped in where before it was a long nip home, with every chance of a ditching in the vast Pacific and little chance of rescue. Iwo was a godsend. After Iwo was the long flight back to Tinian, Saipan and Guam. Most 29s returned safely to flyer gear. But not all were nearly so lucky. This is not Hiroshima. In one night, nearly 16 square miles, 25% of all the buildings in Tokyo were destroyed. One million homeless, 150,000 dead, injured or missing. The LeMay treatment was a terrifying success. The bases in the Pacific were no island paradise, sometimes hot and dusty, sometimes wet and muddy. Low morale was ever present, men living close together in tent cities, a cargo culture far from home, and the ominous fear of not returning from the next mission. The B-29 became a part of the crew. Hampered like a new Cadillac, a certain amount of customizing went on. For example, the official decision to remove the 20 mm tail killer was not seen by some crews as a desirable step. The twin 50 machine guns alone would certainly not be much of a discouragement to enemy fighters. Just the sight of this monster cannon kept fighters well out of range of its non-existent steam. Customizing of another kind was the famous B-29 nose art. When the order came to remove the nose art, there was a ripple of discontent. But in a military situation, orders were orders. Where the order came from, nobody really seems to know. There is one version that says that a number of B-29s went back to the United States and when the nose art was seen, there were objections to the uh, lurid nature of it and therefore the order came back to the people in the combat zone to remove it. Other Versions of that story are that it was decided at the group level by the group commanders. Some wanted to run a cleaner operation than others. A men's high regard for their aircraft made their loss seem even greater. Jot and Josie. 
On April Fool's Day 1945, a small explosion was seen shortly after takeoff. She burst into flames, plunging into the bay of Saipanan. Super Wabaton, lost February 19, 1945. A Japanese suicide attack tore off both wings. She went down. No survivors. Little Joe is over Mia Kanojo on April the 29th, 1945. The crew bailed out. Only six of the 11 men were rescued. Nose art gave them names to be remembered by, but this is surely the most unforgettable name of them all. On the 16th of July, 1945, US scientists exploded the first atomic device. In under one month, a modified B-29 of a specially created 509th composite group would carry the 9,700 pounds uranium bar high above the city of Hiroshima. After a photographing session that make it, made us feel like a Hollywood premiere, we uh, got off at about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, darkness, and headed for Iwo Jima, which we reached about sunrise. We made uh, certain adjustments and tests on the bomb during that flight. We then headed for the Empire, and uh, the weather improved as we went along. We felt that it was our lucky day. We knew it was as we made the final approach toward Hiroshima, which the navigator hit right on the button. Bombardier took over, identified the target, and everything went with perfection not approached in the rehearsal. The bomb was finally released exactly at the designated hour, and the explosion occurred as planned. Uh, my navigator had me perfectly lined up with the target. When I touched in with my sight, I could clearly see the city of Hiroshima within my bomb sight. Then I touched in and took the run, and I felt the bump of the airplane. I was greatly relieved because I knew the unit had gone from the airplane that we had successfully delivered. It meant so much to the Army Air Forces, American science, and industry. The bomb was armed in flight by Captain Parsons to avoid any mishap on takeoff, and all again flew unopposed in all the Hiroshima. Well, as the bomb left the airplane, we took over uh, manual control, made an extremely steep turn to try and put as much distance between ourselves and the explosion as possible. After we uh, felt the uh, explosion hit the airplane, that is the concussion waves, uh, we knew that the bomb had explosion, had exploded, everything was a success. So we turned around to take a look at it. The sight that greeted our eyes was quite uh, beyond what we had expected because we saw this cloud of boiling dust and debris below us with this tremendous mushroom on top. Uh, beneath that was hidden the ruins of the city of Hiroshima. At 9.15 on the morning of the 6th of August 1945, 4.5 square miles of Hiroshima and 78,000 of its inhabitants ceased to exist. Japan, in shock, couldn't come to a decision on peace. The B-29 boxcar carried the second bomb over Nagasaki. Another city disappeared. Fears of death on the war's last days were fueled as bombing went on after Nagasaki. All bombers were turned as peace was declared. A war was over, but the B-29 still had much to accomplish. When a post-war surplus of 29s variants appeared, the Pekusen Dreamboat was a B-29B, modified for long-distance flight, stripped bare inside, extra fuel tanks installed, Andy Gump chinless nacelles fitted, and cars filled with low white helium. It was to break the world distance flight record in November of 1945. A flying fuel tank to 8,198 miles.
In 1946, on the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific, the B-29 atomic bomber would launch the tests of a more powerful A-bomb. Arriving aboard the B-29, the outlaw, a familiar face, General LeMay, now Deputy Chief of Staff of Research. A Marshall group 5,000 miles from the US, surrounded by vast stretches of ocean. A first test target, Akidi Atoll. The B-29 Dave's Dream was specially modified to hold the test bomb in its bay. It would deliver the payload over a target of 93 unmanned naval vessels clustered around a tiny atoll. Other 29s would act as weather planes, flying laboratories, and photographic platforms. Unmanned radio-controlled B-17 drones would fly through the fallout cloud to collect samples. Naval observation ships sat 40 miles from aim point. At 34 seconds past 9 a.m. July the 1st, the atoll and the metal target ships were rocked by a massive blast. The D-29 was the true pioneer of USAF in-flight refueling systems. In this drogue probe system, fuel was transferred down a long hose to the receiver aircraft. A pilot having to close into the end drogue with a probe seat here on the wing tip. Much more successful was the Boeing patented flying boom. A rigid telescopic tube was literally flown into position by an operator in the old tail cut compartment. An aerodynamic V-shaped wing at the tip of the arm allowed steering. A paddle of lights on the belly of the 29 gave the receiver pilot instructions to hold position. During normal flight, the arm could be pivoted under the tail. Coupling and decoupling can be seen closer in this footage of a KC-97 tanker and an early B-52 using the flying boom system pioneered by the B-29. The Soviets had a B-29 of their own. The Tupolev Tu-4 was a direct copy of B-29s it turned during the war. 1,200 were built. The Hap Arnold Special was ironically one of the 29s methodically taken to pieces and copied, alt for bolt. The SB-29 Super Dumbo was basically a B-29 equipped with survival and rescue gear. Its main feature was an A3 lifeboat carried under the fuselage, which could be dropped to down crews. Sixteen SB conversions were carried out. A huge A3 lifeboat must have been a blessing to count, as it was motorized and carried all manner of survival equipment. Coast plan in 1947, the B-29D's designation was changed to B-50. The B-50 had a much stronger airframe. Waiter models had 700-gallon wing tanks and a one-piece plexiglass nose gun. Its Pratt & Whitney R4360 engines produced 3,500 horsepower. A huge tail had a folding tip to allow entry into USAF Nagas. With the B-50 and new B-36 in their arsenal, the USAF could afford to loan the RAF 87 B-29s, designated the Washington Bomber. The B-50, the first aircraft to circumnavigate the globe non-stop, was the final variant of the B-29. In the late 40s, the Super Fort would play another crucial role in the advancement of aviation, this time as a mothership for early experimental supersonic aircraft. At the Air Force Flight Test Center, Edwards Air Force Base, the Bell rocket-powered research aircraft X-1 would attempt to break the sound barrier. A B-29 was used to air-launch the Parasite aircraft around 30,000 feet. In a series of flights, 
USAF test pilot Major Chuck Yeager took the X-1 Glamorous Glennis up close to the sound barrier. On the 14th of October 1947, Jaeger punched the X-1 beyond Mark I into the smooth airflow of supersonic flight. So began a string of B-29 parasite launches that changed the face of aviation technology. The loading of these X-planes was quite interesting, as the huge B-29 had to be elevated on stilts. The parasite X-plane was rolled underneath and hoisted clear of the ground and recessed into the modified bomb bays. Another peculiar parasite aircraft was tested from a B-29. The XF-85 Goblin air-launched fighter was designed to be carried by the Convair B-36. The Goblin could be launched and picked up after completing its mission. When war broke out in Korea in 1950, the B-29 was to play an active and crucial role in support of the UN troops. Used mainly in obedient level interdiction role, it destroyed bridges, roads, and enemy communication lines. But the superfortress dealt many a harsh blow, dropping 167,000 tons of bombs in 21,328 sorties. We operated on all but 26 days of the war, shut down over 30 fighters. 34 superforts were lost in B-29 also deployed the mammoth Tarzan, radio-controlled bombs, a devastating effect. In the heat of Korea, nose art surfaced again. The 29s were soon adorned with pretty girls and comic characters. By the end of the Korean War in 1953, the B-29 was deemed obsolescent. It was soon relegated to only second line duties. Last operational B-29 flew its final mission, a routine radar evaluation flight, on the 21st of June, 1960. I think the, the crews who were flying the B-29s were proud of the fact that they were flying the most advanced aircraft in the world at the time. and. In one specific case, a pilot who flew B-29s during World War II has always insisted that when he flies on an airline, it must be an airline flying Boeing planes. We more or less had the feeling that we were having the Cadillacs of airplanes. It was the, the uh, super bomber. And because of that, we were all quite proud. And it was a good plane. <laughs> 